So before we get started, let's let's start off with some prayer. I'm going to kneel and feel free to stay sitting. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to um, present and, uh, and to share what you have gifted me with. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be here and that you would help us to grasp concepts and pierce our hearts with your character so that we could be changed more into your glorious image. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Okay, so last time, if you remember, I spent the majority of the time defining evolution, breaking it up into the different sections and, and giving an actual definition, and defining most of the concepts that people look at as evolution are religious, they're faith-based, they're not scientific. Today, we're going to be looking at the age of the earth. Try to save the questions until the end. I'm going to go through a lot of information really quickly. How old is this world? When was the beginning? Who cares how old the earth is anyway? Well, the credibility of the Bible is at stake. I mean, do we need a guru to interpret what the words are saying, or can we read it for itself, by itself and interpret it for the words that it actually says? <clears throat> the credibility of Jesus is at stake. Um, 25 times he quotes the book of Genesis, and the entire book of the Bible really is at stake. 200 times in the New Testament, Genesis is quoted. The evolutionists care how old the world is because if they don't have billions of years to hide behind, their theory looks really silly. So the Bible says, by, for him, by him, meaning Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether things, thrones or dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him, for him, and by him. And in the Old Testament, it says that, Je that I am Jehovah and there is no other God. I am Jehovah, and there is no one else. I alone am God. I formed the light, and I made the darkness. The Bible is clear. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. This is a great Bible study, some good references to study that out if you're interested in doing that study. If we dive down to the bottom of the ocean, and we actually find a treasure chest, and we ask ourselves a question, when did this boat sink? We would have to gather all the points in the treasure chest, look at the dates, and find the oldest one and make our guess based off of the limiting factor, what's called the limiting factor, right? I mean, we wouldn't say it, it had to have sank in 1750, right? It had to be after 1801. The Bible says that from the beginning, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That Adam lived 130 years and had a son. That Seth lived 105 years and had a son. And we can add these dates up and come up with a chronological date that the Bible estimates the world is, within about 50 years or so. <clears throat> and that's 6,000 years. Is the age of the earth scientifically established with the Bible? Is the Bible right? The textbooks will tell you no, that the Bible is absolutely wrong, that the earth is billions of years old. It says that every, about 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was smaller than the period on the end of this page, and 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth was a molten ball of hot rock. And it cooled off about 3.9 uh, billion years ago. And then some oceans appeared, and then this ocean was the sludge that life came out of. So life emerged about 3 billion years ago, is what the evolutionary says. It says that these self-emerging systems must have emerged. So this is your grandpa, the primordial goop according to the evolutionary theory. There are numerous scientific ways to show that the world is not billions of years old. As a matter of fact, there's only 10% that show the world is billions and not thousands. So National Geographic says population in 2011 was 7 billion. If we go back to 1800s, it's about 1 billion people. Textbooks, this textbook says 1 billion in 1810. So if we take this exponential graph and we actually come to the point where it graphs back gradually and we go to the two spots that we are really sure at the eight, at how many people were on the earth, go back to about Rome when every nation was censoring very well that the, the amount of people that were on the earth is very well known. And we draw a line right across down to about where we can guesstimate the starting point of population would have been right there. It actually corresponds very well with the Bible 
concept of Noah's flood starting off with eight people. So population growth actually says that uh, we've only been here about 4,000 years. Here's the population mathematics. If we use the same mathematics and we just use a drop in the, in the bucket as far as years go and use that same math formula within just a very short period of time, we would have over 150,000 people per square inch. The evolutionary model has some mathematical issues with population. They do say that the world is overpopulated, though. Lots of people say this is a farce. It's not exactly true. Jacksonville, Florida actually has 25 billion square feet of area just in the county, the county alone. Every person in the entire world could fit in Jacksonville, Florida and have four feet of space to themselves. Let's do it. Have you ever been to Arizona? Yes. Or Texas? Yes. Or South Dakota? The world is not overpopulated. If it's overpopulated where you live, move. That's the issue. People like being together in local areas. See, evolutionists say that the, the world has a cancer and this cancer is man. Jacques Cousteau actually said that to stabilize the world's population, we need to de decrease humanity by 350,000 people per day. Will you first, Jacques? God said that he created the earth to be filled and to be populated. See, evolution and creationism are diametrically opposite. The textbooks will tell you it takes billions of years to go from a white to a red star or a red to a white binary star. But the fact is, in history, Sirius, I don't know if anybody looks up at the stars, it's one of the brightest stars in the sky, used to be red. All the historians said it was red, actually described redder than Mars. It does not take billions of years to go from a red to a white binary star. Jupiter is cooling off. It is hot, has an electromagnetic field. This shows that our solar system is actually young, not old. Couldn't have been billions, only thousands. Same thing with Ganymede. Ganymede is a smaller planet, has an electromagnetic field, and is, is still hot. Would have been cooled off a long time ago if the solar system was really here for billions or millions of years. Saturn's rings are very delicately woven. If it has within even 100,000 years, all of the rings would have been completely rearranged and dissipated outside of the gravitational field of Saturn. Saturn's rings are beautifully complex. The moon is actually getting further away from the Earth every day just a little bit. Now, if you take this math and you go backwards and you use the inverse square law, which says the force of the attraction between the two objects is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So basically what this means is it's like the attraction to a woman. Just one third of the distance closer and the attraction is nine times. So for you men out there, it's a good idea just to keep your distance. It's the same force, which basically means that the moon would have crashed into the earth about one million years, a billion years ago. Not possible to have life in that kind of condition. The comets. Comets are putting off stuff in the atmosphere. They're losing material, which shows that our solar system, again, is young. Thousands, not millions. 10,000 is the estimated. It's like your bank account. If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every single time. The fact that they're still here putting off material means that it's been a short period of time. Now, the, the evolutionists will defend their position by saying the Oort cloud. A scientist by the name of Oort, Jan Oort, he says he proposed. Does anybody know what propose means? It means you hope, you wish, you pray that there was this great spherical shell of comets way far out, about 50,000 astronomical units out, which he never really saw. So let me explain how far this is and the impossibility of seeing a comet this distance. We travel around the sun at one astronomical unit. Pluto is 39 astronomical units away, and it's really difficult to see Pluto with a very strong telescope. There is no possible way that you can see a comet at 50,000 astronomical units away. Nobody's ever seen one. It's just a hypothesis. Oort never saw one. It's really, the whole thing's based on some mathematical errors. 
Evolutionist, many scientists, scientific papers are written each year about the ore cloud. Its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there is not yet a shred of directable, observable evidence for its existence. This is Carl Sagan. Evolutionists will all, often say, if you want me to believe in creation, then you're going to have to prove that the ore cloud doesn't exist. Well, that's not the way science works. So let's look at this. What if I told you if the inside of a watermelon was blue until you cut it open and then it turned red? Prove me wrong. You can't. It's, see, it's called shifting the burden of proof. Science is that you prove that it exists, not that you prove that it doesn't exist. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. See, creation or evolutionists will often say, couldn't God have used evolution to get this whole thing going? Well, let me assure you, the God who would use evolution to get all things going is hateful, wasteful, and a complete ignoramus. It is definitely not the God of the Bible. A lot of evolutionists will use light to express age. That star is 25 billion years of, of light years away. Therefore, it was created 25 billion light years ago. Well, it's a good theory, except for the fact that we know that science is not constant. It can be changed. It has been slowed down and stopped, and it has been sped up over 300 times faster than the regular dominant uh, concept of light, 186,000 miles a second. ABC said the speed of light is no longer the limit. Researchers say that the most convincing demonstration yet that the speed of light, supposedly an ironclad rule of nature, can be pushed beyond its boundaries. Did you know that magnetism loses its magnetism over time? Magnets do. The Earth is losing its magnetic field, actually 10% over the last 150 years. That's a lot, if you just think about it. But this has a great implication that the magnetic field in the Earth prior was greater. The greater the magnetic field, the more radiometric carbon would be pushed out of the atmosphere, which means that the radiocarbon dating method would be flawed. It would be less in the past, so you would get exaggerated dates. Science, uh, popular science actually said that uh, researchers from the University of California in Berkeley discovered the magnetic, the last magnetic field reversal was instant, with nothing in between it. See, for a long time, evolution has said that the magnetic reversals happen very slowly, proving long ages. Well, what we can see, test, and demonstrate says that they happen quickly. They said within 100 years. Really, it's instantly according to what we can see in the past and still observe. Here's a couple of really good articles I recommend you check out. See, is what happened with the flood is the Earth was so damaged by the flood that the, the magnetic reversals reversed uh, a whole bunch right at the flood, and then like wait like uh, ripples in a pond. The further away from the flood they get, the um, the less they frequently they happen. This is this is the same way with with the ice age, which we'll get into in the fourth presentation more. Continental drift and and um, plate tectonics. Plate tectonics they say show and demonstrate that the Earth is old, along with the magnetic reversals. Well, plate tectonics. Um, was actually given a new creationist uh, view with John Barberger, great PhD. He's put together a whole bunch of experiments with how hot rocks interact with each other in, in subduction, with the initial subduction, meaning when plate tectonics first started and the first subduction happened, what was the cause and the effect of that happening? And I'll actually allow him to explain it to you. This is the animation here. And I, I loop the animation several times to so give you an idea. But this, this shows the, this is an actual numerical simulation of this runaway process using actual data from laboratory experiments for the, for the deformation characteristics of the, of the rock. So uh, it's, uh, and this, this is a, uh, represents some, very sophisticated numerical methods to be able to track this physical instability. And a few of my colleagues have, have come up with the ability to do similar work and have validated this calculation. 
And he's suggesting that over a third of the continental movement happened within 25 days of sub the beginning of subduction. Now let's talk about the dating system, and more specifically, carbon dating. But in general, dating, radiometric dating, ever since William Smith and the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the second presentation. Um, but basically, is what it, this is saying is that the first layer up there goes to about 10,000 years. Then the very next layer is 1.8 million years. Well, carbon dating only goes to about 50 or 60,000 years. So in order for you to use a dating system, you have to know how old the rock is to begin with. So the dating systems would never have been able to be used if you didn't already know how old they were. This is what that last statement just said. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Does that make sense? So let's talk a little bit more about radiometric dating and the, the principles that go along with it. If you come into a room and you find a dripping faucet, drip, 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 you can test to see that it's about five milliliters of water per hour. Multiply that out to how much water is in the glass and you can easily see that it's been dripping for 80 hours, right? Wrong. This is the classic math question. If train A leaves such and such at this point, and train B leaves such and such at this point, what time will they cross? Well, it depends on how many stops they have. Is there, is there any interruptions? I mean, are they going perfectly straight? Are they in a plane? Are they flying? Do they have turbulence? Do they have to go over? There's all kinds of variables. So some of the assumptions that you've had to make with the water is how much was in the glass to start with. Did anybody remove any water or add any water? Has the dripping rate stayed the same? There are lots of assumptions that you have to make with these dating systems, and I will readily say all dating systems require an assumption to have faith in, even every single one of them I'm using today. Radiocarbon is forming 28 to 30% faster than it's decaying, which in itself disproves the concept of radiometric dating. So remember I said the Earth's magnetic field is, is pushing away the carbon, which would upset that. So the concept of carbon dating is that the atmosphere has 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.06% carbon dioxide, and 0.000765 of radiocarbon, which is basically up in the upper part of the atmosphere, the sun interacted with the carbon and changed it radioactive. Then it drifts down and the plants breathe carbon dioxide and they can't distinguish the difference between radiocarbon and non-radiocarbon. So it breathes it in and it gets trapped in the plants. So either the animals eat the plants and then we eat the animals or we eat the plants that have the carbon in them. And so the, the theory goes that everything has the same amount of carbon in it. Now this is the mathematical testable fact is that Every 6,000 years, 5,730, half of the carbon is diffused. Nobody's questioning what I can see as far as the dripping rate goes right now. So, 6,000 years ago, half of it's gone. 12,000 years ago, there's still a quarter of it. Another uh, 6,000 is an eighth, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? All the way until about 40 or 50,000 years, and then it's so low that you can't actually test it anymore. There's not enough to be tested with what we have today. Apart from very modern examples, which are really archaeology, I can think of no cases that radioactive decay being used to date fossils. And if you talk to an archaeologist, they don't rely on any carbon dating to date their stuff. It's too questionable. There are too many things that can contaminate it, and so it's not really a reliable source. And here's the perfect example. This mammoth, one part of it tested, carbon tested, at 29,500 years. The other part of the same animal tested at 44,000 years. This is not science. Here's a freshly killed seal that was tested at 1,300 years. These are faulty and, flaw and flawed. See, they will say that if the C14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. But if the dates entirely contradict them, 
we put them in the footnote. Or don't contradict, entirely contradict them, we put them in the footnotes. And if they completely are outdated, we just drop them all together. They pick and choose what they want. Here's a great scientist, Dr. Gentry. Dr. Gentry discovered mica in granite. He went all over the world and got samples of granite from around the world and discovered in this mica that there was this residue of the radioactivity that had taken place so long ago. It had polonium and uranium halos in this granite. Basically, when something decays like that, it lets off an alpha and a gamma particle, kind of like a firecracker. Boom, and it explodes and has this crazy thing. So we believe that as it decays, it's letting off the alpha particles, leaving these rings of the decay going through. Now, the polonium halo actually has a lifespan of between 3 minutes and 160 fourths of a second. Which means, if you put, for example, if you put an Alka-Seltzer in a glass of water and put it in a freezer, it wouldn't freeze like this, it would freeze like this. Because the Alka-Seltzer dissipated before it could be frozen. The only way that you could get rings like this is if the granite was instantaneously created in solid in 164ths of a second to catch that one particular ring. So scientifically, the Earth was created in 164ths of a second. God spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The other thing that we can see is the uranium halos that are in this have polonium in the decay ring as it changes into lead. Now, if there's polonium in the decay rate in the nearby vicinity, that means that the, the lead rate's going to be elevated and the dating system's flawed. Does that make sense? Hopefully. The other thing the scientists showed was that the rock was never molten. It was never in a hot, molten form. Creation's Tiny Myth Myth Mysteries is a great book. I recommend that you get it. In New Mexico, during 1974, they dug down 2.6 miles and they found these zircon crystals. Zircon crystals. Inside the zircon crystals, which they say is the oldest rock on the planet at 4.6 billion years old. It also releases helium every time it goes through its decay rate. Well, how much helium is in the rock? And how old do you think, it, how long does it take for the helium to diffuse outside of the zircon crystals? Well, evolutionists made a prediction there on the bottom, and creationists made a prediction there on the top. We went in and crushed the rock and, and saw how it diffused out of the rock. And what do you think the, the, the uh, result was of the experiment? Did it line up with the evolutionary or the creation? It lined up with the creation perfectly. This is astonishing. There's only one other time I've ever seen any experiment line up with this kind of a predictive force. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit later with, with uh, genetic decay. 6,000 years of time is what the helium says in the zircon crystals. So the zircon crystal says that it's, the Earth is 6,000 years old. So now we have a dilemma. We have one dating system that says young and one dating system that says old in the same rock. We've got some conflict. So what are you going to believe? Well, you have to go with the limiting factor. The true date has to be 6,000 years, and the uranium decay rate has been altered somehow. A good book or documentary about this topic is thousands, not billions. What about potassium argon dating? Potassium argon, so basically, as much as 80% of potassium in a small sample of iron meteor can be removed in distilled water in just four and a half hours. Potassium is not a good testing method if it can be diffused like this. But let's use an example of a, of a flaw, of a, a funny incident that happened. So they, tated, they did this KBS tuff, which is a lava flow, at 212 and 230 million years, somewhere between those two dates. They tested it and retested it and retested it. This is a foundational date. Until they found something that was a little bit shocking underneath a human skull, which was only supposed to be here for 209 million years. Something's wrong. So they retested the layer, and they came up with 0.5 to 2.6 million years. Hmm. 
That's interesting. That's down 212 million years. None of your teacher would accept a 500% error rate. And that's what it is. The lava flows in Hawaii that we know happened in the 1800s test at 1.6 to 1.4 million years. Potassium argon is not a good dating system. This is what I don't understand. If you use it on rocks that you know how old it is and you get faulty dates, why would you use the system on rocks you don't know how old it is and expect to get the right dates? That's my big issue. Did you know that deserts grow? And in the Sahara Desert is the largest desert in the world. The wind blows across the desert, hot air blows into the adjacent forest and kills the plants. It's called desertification as it grows. Well, this is a testable, testable thing. So you can look at this desert and actually tell how old it is. It's 4,000 years old. Why would the largest desert in the world be 4,000 years old? I got an idea. Because 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. 4,000 years ago, there was a flood, and it's really hard to have a desert under a flood. Oil. Now, the amount of dirt that actually is compressing down on the oil is, excuse me, about 6,000 pounds of pressure. But the oil itself sometimes is 20,000 pounds of pressure. Well, the only way that this could withstand this kind of pressure and not crack and diffuse is if it's less than 10,000 years old. This shows thousands, not millions. As a matter of fact, we all know now that oil and coal comes from organic material. Australia, in 1996, put $22.4 million into making um, oil, and they did it in 30 minutes. Again, 4 billion barrels of crude oil they made from 600 tons of turkey guts, and they did it in 30 minutes. It does not take millions of years to make oil. 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. 4,000 years ago, there was a flood, and there was a whole bunch of dead stuff that got buried in that flood, making the oil and coal deposits. We'll talk much more about that in the fourth, er, the fifth, fourth and fifth presentation. But the next time you go to the gas station and you get gas in your car, say, bye-bye, Grandpa. Should have gone on the ark. Ice cores. Let's look at ice cores. They dig down like places like Greenland and then they get these huge ice cores. They store them in these freezers and they look at these rings telling, saying that these are annual layers saying, look, right there, you have a dark and a light spot, which is a winter, summer cycle. Annual layers, they say. 10,000 feet core, 135,000 layers. That means this ice core sample is 135,000 years. Right? This textbook says annual layers. Bill Nye says 680,000 snow, winter, summer cycles. How could it be that just 4,000 years ago, all of this ice formed? That's a really good question. So the Lost Squadron is a really good place to go if you'd like some answers on this. See, in World War II, they flew over and they actually ran out of gas and left their planes in Greenland. We went back years later to find them and they were buried under the snow a long ways. 263 feet to be exact in just 48 years. So we actually devised a pretty cool way with heat wa and water and coil, burrowed down into the, uh, into the ice, disassembled the planes, took them back to the museum, and re reassembled the planes. And that one of the planes is on display right now. But Bob, one of the supervisors on the site, actually said that there were many hundreds of layers in the ice that was laid down in just 48 years. Now, if those are annual layers, shouldn't we just have 48 layers, not hundreds? Actually, said 30 or 40 layers was laid down in just nine years. And that was at 62 feet laid down. Just incredible. So if we do some math, from 1942 to 1990, that's 48 years, 263 feet, that's five and a half feet of ice a year. Okay? 10,000 feet at five and a half uh, feet is 1,824 years. Easy to answer in the creation model. 
even with the compression of the ice getting closer down and, and the pressure getting increased. It's easy to answer. But the, but the textbooks will still tell you annual layers, and this is just an assumption. As a matter of fact, there are 42 or 43 different words in the Inuit language for snow, because you have some mushy snow and slightly more, I don't know. I'm from Oregon. We've got snow. But there's 43 different kinds in the Inuit. This guy produced 15 layers on his windshield in just eight hours. Those are not annual layers. They tell you that the geologic column are layers and were laid down over millions of years. But, the truth, the, but also the erosion tells us that the whole earth would be eroded flat in just 14 million years. So which one's right? You can't have it both ways. I mean, the rocks that are there are just 300 times older than they should be. You've got a 35% difference in layers. So if you dig down over here, and you take how many layers are there, and you dig down over here, and you tell how many layers are there, there's a 35% difference. And you have catfish swimming up through the layers. Polystrata trees going between layer, layer, layer. Here's a polystrata tree. This guy right here starts off as coal, goes through a clay layer, and then ends up as coal again. How did this happen over millions of years? So Mount St. Helens actually gave us a lot of good science about this. I'll go more into this in the fourth and fifth presentation, but real quickly, when the roots or when the trees are blown over and they're uprooted by some great natural force, all the smaller roots are left behind, and when they go into the water, they actually float and sink vertical because the root mass is heavier and so it actually goes down and, and uh, gets buried vertically. So it kind of looks like Yosemite National Park. Here's a fossil giving birth. I promise you that it did not take millions of years for this animal to give birth to this other animal. Fossils don't take millions of years. Here's a coal of somebody chopping up their firewood. This is not old, this is recent. Here is a petrified cowboy foot still in the boot. Here's the fossilized cowboy hat to go with it. Not really, it's from a different location. But there's the teddy bear to make the whole set complete. It does not take millions of years to make fossils. This is erroneous. They say that the Mississippi is evidence that the world is old. It puts in 80,000 tons per hour. Actually, the entire state of New Orleans is from the sediment. They say 30,000 years of sediment has accumulated, proving that the 6,000-year day is wrong. Well, I have an answer to that. 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. 4,000 years ago, there was a flood, and most of that erosion happened when the waters were receding off the continents, when we'll talk about more in 4 and 5. And a lot of the erosion has taken place since then. It's easy to explain. But my question for evolutionists is, if it's been there for 30,000 years, why isn't the, or we've been here for millions of years, why isn't the entire Gulf of Mexico filled up? That's the better question. Trees, they say the same thing. Annual layers, and these demonstrate old ages. This actually gives the history of when and when, when uh, what took place in history and when it took place. So let's look at this. The textbooks will tell you that this is an annual layer. One rain per year. Summer, winter, summer, winter. Just like the ice rings. This is the assumption. Here's a gentleman who did an experiment. He grew up a tree for three years and he got six rings. Three years, six rings. He got an extra rain in a drought, he got an extra rain in spring, and an extra rain in fall. They're not annual layers. That's the issue. We actually know that you can put on an extra layer and the bristlecone pines, by the winter time, the light reflecting off the sun puts on an extra rain. Not annual rains. I have a tree on my front porch that has 101 rings on one side and 115 rings on the other. These are not annual layers, or rings. Then they say that they can put trees side by side and tell thousands of years. This is ridiculous. General Sherman was thought to have 6,000, uh, was to be thought to be 6,000 years old, but it actually, when it's been bored out, only have 2,000 rings, well within the creation model. 
Trees are just not a good way to tell how old the earth is. Coral reefs. World War II, we went into Australia, the largest coral reef in the world, the Barrier Reef, and we ruined it. We drove a ship through it and broke a whole piece out. Now, the good thing is we've actually been able to study it, and we know how long it takes for coral to grow now. We can test and see how long it takes. So the largest coral reef in the world, how old do you think it is? 4,000 years old. Now, why would the largest coral reef in the world only be 4,000 years old? I've got an idea. 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. 4,000 years ago, there was a flood, and it was really hard to have a coral reef under the flood. Niagara Falls. They say that Niagara Falls proves that the world is old. The erosion rate demands that it's 9,900 years, right? So, that's what the textbooks say. It is true, uh, waterfalls erode and they erode backwards over time. This is a testable fact. As a matter of fact, uh, Charles Lyell, in 1841, it was one of his evidences in the book Principles of Geology, which we'll talk more about in the next presentation, Basically, use this for an evidence against creation, saying the water is eroded from there to there with a 16-foot-a-year erosion rate. Well, we can actually, and that's, that's three and a half miles that eroded. So since 1841 until now, it's eroded three and a half miles more in 160 years. So something is wrong. If we take the actual erosion rate that we can see, test, and demonstrate all the way up to about the year when they made the dam and altered the flow, and we take it out and we get 4.7 uh, feet per year. We take that calculation and we do our own math, and it's kind of funny, but we come up with 8,426 years. So the textbook didn't even get the math right, but that's easily explainable in the creation model. 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth, 4,000 years ago, there was a flood, and there was a whole bunch of that uh, canyon that was eroded right away. And then over the course of the last 4,000 years, it's continued to erode. Here's a more important question. If the world is billions of years old, as this says, 4.6 billion years old, then how come has Niagara Falls only eroded from there to there? Why isn't it at least all the way to Lake Erie? It hasn't gone very far if the world really is as old as they say it is. Only seven and a half miles is eroded. Something's wrong. The, the salt level in the ocean. If you take the salt level in the ocean and you test it and you go backwards, according to when we would have distilled water, you only have thousands, not millions. So the oceans de demand that the earth is thousands, not millions. 6,000 years ago, God created the earth. 4,000 years ago, most of the ocean was slightly salty, not very. And then over the course of the last 4,000 years, the salinity of the oceans have gotten greater and greater and greater, making this gulf between saltwater and freshwater things huge. So basically, saltwater crocodiles and freshwater crocodiles had a common ancestor, a crocodile which is much easier to explain saltwater or freshwater than evolutionary standards. We came from a rock to a croc. Uh, David Clifton actually took his black mollies and over a course of just two weeks, he introduced salt every day and made his black mollies saltwater fish. Completely and legitimately saltwater. He put them in freshwater and they were dead in 30 minutes. They were legitimate saltwater fish. It is easy to go from fresh to saltwater. How about stalactites and stalagmites? Who here was told that it proves that the earth is old? I was told that it proves that the earth is old. Textbooks will tell you four inches per thousand years. I was actually told one inch per thousand years. This is completely erroneous. This is 50 inches in 40 years. Huh. Seems like the textbooks are quite measuring up. This bat was buried as a stalagmite before it was able to decay. Fast, not slow. There's some stalactite, stalagmite activity in just 40 years. This cave was sealed up for just 55 years. And those two people that are standing in that circle tell you how huge that thing has grown in just 55 years. These don't happen slowly. 
Here is a gutter that they had to put in a garage because stalagmites were growing on the cars parking under it. These don't take thousands or millions of years. Actually, is what they are is a calcium buildup from the deposits in the water. This gentleman in 1903 made a fountain. The water has lots of minerals in it. And that's what it looks like today in just less than 100 years. It does not take millions of years for stalagmites and stalactites to form. But it would take a lot of lime away to get that stain out of there. Let's talk about thermodynamics in genetics. In 1950, we were afraid that one third of the population was being, uh, being affected by mutations. Basically, that one out of three people were handing down mutations to their children. Well, the information is a little bit more surprising than they once thought. Because the truth is, it's three mutations per cell division every day. This is hugely significant. It means when you're 15 years old, you have accumulated 6,000 permanent mutations. By the time you're 60, 40,000 mutations. And for you kids out there, there's only one way that you can slow this down, and that's with a good diet. We'll talk more about that in the first, fourth presentation. But the second law of thermodynamics expressed in genetics means that we're going to go down. And Michael Lynch agrees completely and says that the mutation rate is 1 to 5% per generation. Well, John Sanford, who actually invented the gene gun, did some experiments of his own and grafted out what the, what the genome would look like at a 1% decay rate. So he grafted a 1% decay rate, and then he took the ages in Genesis chapter 5, those long, unscientific ages of humanity living 900 years old, and he lined it up with the genetic decay rate. And bam! Amazing. This is the other the other experiment that I told you that's lined up closer than I've ever seen any experiment. This is astonishing. Which basically means Genesis chapter 5 is scientifically substantiated by the ages of the earth with genetic decay. We are going down, not up, as evolution says. The principles are the same. If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every single time. Not to mention that when he does these experiments, just inside 3, 300 generations, genetic collapse happens, where everybody just falls apart. This is why we're having so many genetic diseases going around. <clears throat> Michael Lynch said, significant incapacitation at the morphological, physiological, and neurobiological levels. I mean, you can't get any worse than that. John Sanford said, Late in my career, I did something which for a Cornell professor would seem unthinkable. I began to question the primary axiom, random mutation, natural selection. I did this with great fear and trepidation. By doing this, I knew I would be at odds with the most sacred cow of modern academia. Among other things, I might, it might even result in my expulsion from the academic world. To my own amazement, I gradually realized that the seemingly great and unassailable fortresses which has been built up around the primary axiom is really a house of cards. The primary axiom is actually an extremely vulnerable theory. In fact, it is essentially indefensible. Its apparent invincibility derives mostly from bluster, smoke, and mirrors. A large part of what keeps the axiom is almost a mystical faith, which the true believers have in the omnipotence of natural selection. If the primary axiom is wrong, then there is a surprising and practical consequence when subjected only to natural forces. The human genome must inevitably degenerate over time. Such a sober realization should have more than just an intellectual or historical significance. It should rightfully cause us to personally reconsider where we should rationally be placing our hope for the future. And without Christ, there is no hope for the future. More information on this, Genetic Entropy by John Sanford, an evolutionist turned creationist, great book. Remember he did the experiment and after 300 generations you'd have genetic decay, collapse is what he said. Well, we know by um, the mitochondrial DNA that we're at that 300 generation mark. 
So just what he proposed, there is no hope without Christ, is absolutely correct. But this 300 generations is exactly what we'd expect. It says that 6,000 years we've been around. Every person in the world is descended from a single ancestor 3,500 years ago. This study says scientists have worked out the most recent and common ancestor of all 6 billion people alive today. Probably dwelt in Asia around 1415. Yes, they're absolutely right. We did have a common ancestor. His name was Adam. See, the evidence shows that we go back to a common ancestor 6,000 years ago. Evolution is saying, no, 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 it was only one of 6,000 years ago. The problem with that is there's no evidence. This is faith. The science says that we go back to one, which is exactly what the Bible says. Exactly what population says. Let's look at the human history. See, the year 2000 was 4,700 on the Chinese calendar. Pretty right on, a little bit off. The oldest known um, cultures using agriculture is at least 5,000 years old. The year 2000 was 5,760 for the Hebrew calendar. And that's even after they changed it 164 years so they could sidestep the prophecy in Daniel, which I'm going to talk about in presentation number four. Actually, the Egyptian calendar is the only calendar that is in conflict with the Bible. Now, when you, this is a great book to study more into this, but just really quickly, is what they do with the Egyptian calendar is there are many um, pharaohs that reign together in different regions, and they put them consecutively so that it expands the age of the Egyptian history by quite a long ways. Why are all the oldest and reliable historical records less than 6,000 years old? Remember, we have to go with the limiting factors, the shortest dates. Science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate. 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. 4,000 years ago, there was a flood. The Bible is scientifically accurate about its age. Remember, 10% of the dating systems say old. 90% say young. The evidence in the creation side is way overweighing the side of the evolution. So if there is a God, you should probably find out who he is and what he desires. What does the Bible say about God's will for you? Well, the angel of the Lord came and said, I bring good news of great joy for all people. See, this is good news, not good advice. Good advice is if you do something, it'll work out for your best interest. Good news is just that, good news. So let's talk about that good news. God predestined the whole human race from all time, every generation, from Adam to us. He predestined everyone to be with him. See, in John 1, 29, it says, The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Ephesians, it says, or uh, Jesus said, Take the inheritance prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Prepared for the foundation of the world. And he also said, you are going into hell, into eternal punishment that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not for us. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. He predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ. For we also, we, are, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him. You lived in this world without God and without hope, one time, hopefully, far, far in the past. But now, in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near. For Jesus is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down the dividing wall of hostility so he might create in himself one new man making peace. So together we are one body, Christ, reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death, or at least supposed to be. Remember the vision that we talked about in the first half of the presentation where Peter was given the vision about the animals? What was the point of the vision? That God had shown him not to call any human being unclean or unholy. See, the cross is universal. In conclusion,
conclusion, just as one man's transgression resulted in condemnation to all men, Romans says, in the same way, through the one act of righteousness, justification came to all men. Universal. But does this mean that everybody is going to be with God in heaven forever? No. Not at all. The truth is, is that God is pro-choice for life. He wants you to call him his friend. He's desperate to have a relationship with you. See, the one thing that God can't create is a relationship with you. He can create all kinds of things. He has unlimited power, but love has to be given freely. God's will is that not one of us be lost. But when he sends his Holy Spirit upon the world, the sin will be to refuse to believe him. It is completely possible for you to plug your ears, turn your life away from him, and reject him and who he is and the relationship that he offers with you. He's too much of a gentleman to make you do it. There are many places in the Bible that says that he will allow you to make your own choices for your own destiny and refuse this beautiful relationship with him. But if you are Christ's and you're not doing anything for him, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? I mean, don't you know we're at war? You don't have to be at the front lines like some people are called to the front lines. But you can carry the bullets for the people who are. What are you going to say when you're standing in front of Christ and he asks you, who did you bring with you with the talents I gave you? Because see, none of the gold, none of the technology, none of it matters to him except for personal relationships with each and individual, each every one of us. You're going to be dead for a really long time. Probably a lot longer than you're alive. You're just going to get a dash in between those numbers. This day, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and I beg you to choose life. This is eternal life, intimately knowing God. <laughs> And Jesus Christ, whom he has said. So maybe it's time to dust it off that Bible and read into that love letter that he's given to all of us. Truthlink.org is a great place to get started if you need some help. Um, you can go on there, free Bible studies. You can register. Great, great stuff. Thank you very much.